Back in January, I did a series of videos based on an article in Edge by Helena Cronin in response to that magazine's question for 2017, which was, what scientific term or concept ought to be more widely known? Her answer? Sex. In particular, sex differences. In that article, she made the case that biological sex differences had been thrown out and replaced by gender. Quote, Biological differences were thought to spell genetic determinism, immutability, anti-feminism, and most egregiously, women's oppression. Gender, however, was the realm of societal forces. Male and female were social constructs, the stuff of political struggle. So gender was safe sex. She went on in that article to ponder what the UK workplace would look like if the gender ideologues got their way and implemented equal representation across occupations. So for example, in the UK, because nursing is 90% female, 256,000 female nurses would have to find another job to make way for the men. 570,000 men would have to move out of the construction and building trade sector just to make way for an equal number of women. The UK would also need 15,000 more female window cleaners, 127,000 more female electricians, 143,000 more female vehicle mechanics, and 131,000 female metal machinists. And off the back of that video, I made another video about the seismic shifts that would have to take place in the US workforce to meet the gender ideologue's utopian view of a 50-50 gender representation across occupations. Not that I believe for a second that feminists and gender ideologues truly desire a 50-50 representation across all occupations. Feminists in particular only seem to be interested in parity in high-paying, high-prestige jobs like positions on corporate boards, jobs in STEM fields and politics. Now down here in Australia we are admittedly a little behind the eight ball when it comes to ideologically driven employment policy, but we're doing our best to catch up. Gender job quotas, state contractors forced to hire 40% women. Under new sex quotas set by the Australian Human Rights Commission, government contractors would be forced to employ a workforce consisting of at least 40% women. Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins has told the federal government to take disruptive action and make private sector contractors hire more women to help close the 16% pay gap between male and female workers. Ah, the good old pay gap, the myth that never dies. Under the plan, companies that fail or refuse to recruit similar numbers of men and women risk losing lucrative government contracts in the gender-bending experiment intended to boost women's pay, but which business groups have warned could mean a bad outcome for taxpayers and tougher conditions for small business. Ms Jenkins wants government agencies to include a clause in contracts requiring demonstrated efforts to improve gender balance, with targets of 40% women. Contractors would have to prove that they have gender balance shortlist for job interviews. This means that the gender balance in the organisation would be 40% men, 40% women with the remaining 20% unallocated to allow for flexibility, Ms Jenkins said. I would want to see evidence that organisations had made extra efforts to reach these targets in recruitment, for example through gender balance shortlist. In male dominated industries I would want to see data that indicated an upward trend in the recruitment and retention of women over time. And what about female dominated industries I hear you ask? Well, that doesn't matter of course, but it kind of does, since the article points out that women make up 80% of the healthcare workforce and 70% of workers in education. And of course men make up at least 80% of the workforce in industries such as construction, electricity and water supply and manufacturing. Now this is big business. The federal government awarded over 70,000 contracts worth $57 billion to private companies in 2015-16. And so it's little wonder that private industry, people who actually know how business works as opposed to government bureaucrats, weren't happy with this proposal. Business groups blasted the social engineering proposal yesterday warning that some companies could go broke if locked out of government work. Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Chief Executive James Pearson said government agencies should seek to maximise value for taxpayers' money instead of dictating who contractors employ. Well, who cares about maximising value for taxpayers when you've got more important things to worry about like diversity? If gender balance requirements are imposed on government contractors, we may find that in some industries only a few contractors can bid, which means less competition and potentially a bad outcome for taxpayers, he said. It could make it harder for small businesses wanting government work at a time when government says it wants to help them. Exactly, so just start up a construction company with 40% women and you'll get a bunch of government contracts and you won't have to worry about competition. You can charge 
what you like. Good work if you can get it. But are we really surprised that this kind of proposal would come from the Human Rights Commission, the same organisation that publicly trawls for grievance mongers offended by cartoons, that wants to monitor what gets said around your kitchen table? At this point, the Human Rights Commission is just another government institution overrun with social engineering ideologues that serves no useful purpose and needs to be shut down. Here's Michael Costa and Campbell Newman on last night's Bolt Report commenting on this absurd proposal. Look, I think all of us, uh, you, me, Campbell, we we support uh, greater female participation in industry. I don't think there's any argument about that. But this is a ridiculous way to firstly make the point and secondly to go about trying to make any uh, realistic change in the the, uh, labour market. I mean, you know, I'll be looking at the budget next week to see if they've defunded this particular body. It it, it just continues uh, Mm. to come out with absurd positions that are... Uh, economically irrational uh, and we're still culturally out of the mainstream. It's absurd, it's uh, not going to do anything and, you know, Andrew, as you know, I mean, we've got a real problem in our um, uh, infant education system, our primary education system with a balance of males and females where we need more men. Are we going to apply the same logic there uh, and not offer funding for schools that don't have 50% um, you know, male uh, primary school teachers? The whole thing is ridiculous. Yeah, well, Andrew, and, and the thing that gets me is I'm, I'm a, a proud father of two daughters, two young women, early 20s. There are no glass ceilings for them. They don't need this stuff, and I talk to them. They don't care about this stuff. They, if they want to go and do something in their lives, they're going to go and do it in, in mm. their respective careers. And I just, I just think the sort of, the, you know, some of these bodies are, fi- are fighting the, the battles of the past. If we're so, if we're so, if she's so upset about sex discrimination, why is every sex discrimination commissioner being a woman, and why is most of these uh, staff of the Human Rights Commission female too? That's gender inequality. I want them to look at themselves oh, before they start yeah, waving Andrew, the finger at Andrew, anyone else. Yeah. Andrew, I was on a Qantas Quant- a Link flight coming back from Emerald today, and you know what? The entire crew, as best as I could make out, were women. Both the pilots Shocking. were women. The cabin Shocking. crew were women. Right, I, fe- go, I felt, guys, I felt go. assaulted and assailed. <laughs> Honestly, this is a joke. Yep, it is a joke, but unfortunately it isn't to the fruitcakes at the Human Rights Commission. Mr Pearson said the government already required firms with more than 100 workers to report on gender equity measures through the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, which collects data but does not impose quotas. Ah yes, speaking of useless, ideologically driven government departments, the Gender Equality Agency that bothers companies to report on gender equity measures, which just means how many women do you employ, has an interesting little problem of its own. Last year, Sam Kennard, one of Australia's most successful businessmen and member of the Liberal Democrats, penned a piece for the Centre for Independent Studies on the ridiculous burden of red tape imposed by the WGEA. Civil disobedience shame worn with pride. Anyone doubting the ludicrous levels of government meddling in business need look no further than the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. This taxpayer-funded generator of needless red tape requires businesses with more than 100 employees to complete annual paperwork delving into gender ratios and salaries. It then publicly names and shames companies that don't complete that paperwork, including mine, as noted in recent media. My company does not discriminate for race, age, sex or religion. If someone has a good attitude, is not afraid of work and willing to learn, they're a starter in our view. Let me say too... This is not a particularly profound or enlightened perspective. It's just common sense and good for business. But we do discriminate against time-wasting bureaucracies. The WGEA is a prime example of unnecessary government intrusion, and my business has much more productive endeavours to pursue than filling out paperwork for government agencies like the WGEA. We are challenged enough to make our business better, to give customers a better experience, and to operate efficiently without distractions like this. And here's the kicker to this $5 million taxpayer-funded bureaucracy. The WGEA has five male and 25 female employees. And here's a stunning admission from one of their spokeswomen. We receive substantially more female than male applicants for job vacancies, a spokeswoman said. Well, fancy that. So why couldn't that type of logic be applied to other areas of the employment sector? Instead of this ideologically driven quest for sameness, How about a recognition that males and females make somewhat different choices about the types of occupations they want to pursue? How about treating people as individuals rather than a member of some amorphous collective? 
So let's go out with a quote from Helena Cronin, who identifies where the quest for equality was confused with sameness. Gender proponents seem to be blithely unaware that thanks to their conflation of equality and sameness, they're now answering an entirely different set of concerns, such as diversity, underrepresentation, imbalance, without asking what on earth they have to do with the original problem, discrimination. And the confusions ramify. Bear in mind that equality is not sameness. Equality is about fair treatment, not about people or outcomes being identical. So fairness does not and should not require sameness. However, when sameness gets confused with equality, and equality is of course to do with fairness, then sameness ends up undeservedly sharing their moral high ground. And male-female discrepancies become a moral crusade. Why so few women CEOs or engineers? It becomes socially suspect to explain this as the result not of discrimination, but of differential choice. Well, it shouldn't be suspect, because the sexes do differ, and in ways that on average make a notable difference to their distribution in today's workplace. Amen to that. So what do you think about this new social engineering program cooked up by the Human Rights Commission? Are they off their rocker? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. See you next time.